These are the 5.4 notes. This is on World War I. And what we're going to do in World War I is we're going to analyze the causes and consequences of United States involvement in World War I. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the causes of World War I or the battles of World War I or anything like that. We're going to talk mostly about how the U.S. got involved, um, the role of propaganda once the U.S. did get involved, and the unified war effort, and then, of course, how that took away people's individual liberties. And then we're eventually going to talk about Woodrow Wilson's leadership, who was our president in the Treaty of Versailles, and then also in the creation of the League of Nations. So as we get started, we're just going to review quickly what the causes of World War I were, and they're known by this acronym MAINE, Militarism, Secret Alliances, Imperialism, and Nationalism. And really they kind of work together. Nationalism leads to imperialism, kind of like what we were talking about in the first uh, three parts of the standard. And then to become imperialistic, you need a military, which is our navy, to protect your colonies and trade routes. And once you have a military, you begin to look for alliances to help you in times of need, since other nations also have empires and militaries. And so that's how, that's really how a war is going to occur. All it's going to take is an igniting incident. Um, what you need to understand is that for us to make the world safe for democracy after World War I, then we have to understand um, how the war actually started and nationalism and alliances, and I'll show some of the problems later with the treaty that ends the war. Nation really refers to a group of people who share a common language, religion, history, and tradition. Not all nations are countries or states. Uh, many are actually included within empires, especially when we're talking about imperialism. And so there's a lot of like ethnic and ideological differences which are going to lead to conflict within those empires. An example is that is the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and kind of that's really why the war starts with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. If you see here, this is a map of all the different or the different countries in uh, that's before World War One started, and uh, just how how it's kind of broken down. And this shows. This shows the two major alliances in this map. You have Britain and France and Russia uh, in one alliance, and then Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy in the other. So nationalism is going to spur competition among states. Uh, they're all going to try to build bigger militaries, and they're going to have this military alliance in order to protect themselves against other countries. The igniting incident is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he was shot in Bos Bo uh, Bosnia by a Serbian nationalist. The resulting confrontation between Austria-Hungary and Serbia is eventually going to lead to a huge war um, amongst Europe. And we're not going to need to necessarily know each individual detail of how that started, but it's important to understand the basics as we're getting into World War I, so you can understand the Treaty of Versailles at the end. And so this, is, this shows like how it all kind of started with Germany, or sorry, Serbia and Austria-Hungary right there, and that's kind of where the war started, and then... Uh, each country is then going to be pulled into the war because of their alliances. At the beginning of the war, though, the United States is going to declare neutrality, and that means that they're not going to get involved in the war at all. However, there's going to be many reasons why the U.S. eventually gets involved. The biggest reason is going to have to do with trade. Uh, remember, we're coming off of the Industrial Revolution, and we're trying to sell our goods. And so as Europe's at war, they need to buy goods from somewhere, and we want to supply them with those goods. And so we try to supply both Britain and Germany with goods because we want to make as much money as possible. However, it's pretty, it actually becomes impossible to trade with Germany because the British Navy is going to blockade the German ports. And so since we've always been pretty close to Great Britain anyways, that's not that big of a deal. Um, so we're going to start trading with Great Britain more, trying to trade with Great Britain more and more. Well, the Germans aren't going to like that, so they're going to try and sink our ships, sink the U.S. ships um, that are going to trade with Great Britain. Uh, the U.S. also makes loans to the Allies in order to continue trade. Um, and because we want to keep bringing in that money. And also, public opinion is generally on the British side, since we've always had this traditional connection with the British. We see the British as the good guys and the Germans as the bad guys, even though a lot of, there are a lot of German immigrants in the United States, which is going to cause some problems. Of course, the Germans are going to try and stop our shipments to Great Britain, since they're at war with Great Britain. And so us supplying the British, it will really hurt the Germans. They try and sink our ships that are on the, on the way over to Britain to give them, our war, give them war goods. Um, the use of submarine war, warfare is going to affect public opinion against the Germans. We're going to see the Germans as being bad guys. And it's also going to hurt President Wilson, who's getting, getting upset by the loss of innocent lives. Uh, the, the most famous was the sinking of the Lusitania, which is right here. Um, the Germans sank it, saying it was shipping war goods, which it was actually shipping war goods. And in the process, uh, process of sinking it, 1,200 people died along with some Americans. 
And so that's going to make that's going to make Americans upset to see the loss of American life. Um, eventually, Germany's going to Germany's going to say they're not going to use submarine warfare as much, but then eventually they're going to restart submarine warfare, which is good, what's going to eventually get us into the war. And here's a picture of the German submarines. In 1916, when Wilson ran for re-election, he actually ran on the slogan that he kept us out of the war, and that was a very popular statement. Most Americans did not want to get into the war which is kind of in interesting because the U.S. gets in the war um, in the next year. <clears throat> One thing that's going to happen is that the, um, the British are going to intercept a German telegram called the Zimmerman Note. And the Zimmerman Note was written to Mexico, which, was, which said that if Mexico helped Germany, then Germany would help Mexico get all of their land back that the U.S. took from them. That would be like Arizona, New Mexico, California, Texas, um, and this is really going to upset American citizens, thinking that the Germans are trying to team up with Mexico. Even though, in actuality, this may have not been a real telegram, the British could have made it up. And here's a picture of the telegram right here. The decision of Germany to resume unrestricted submarine warfare is what's going to cause Wilson to um, push Congress to, for a declaration of war. And also, Wilson wants to try to broker a peace after the war, which is going to his goal is to make the world safe for democracy. And that's what the whole 14 points is about. That's our goal as we go into the war is to make the world safe for democracy. And Wilson wants to eventually institute the 14 points. This is a very progressive plan. It's very idealistic. It kind of goes along with um, a lot of what Wilson believed at the time. There, there are lots of parts to it, like they want freedom of the seas and an end to secret treaties, armed regulations, self-determination of people, and an international peace organization, which is going to be called the League of Nations. And once the Russians drop out of the war, which Russia was a monarchy, then it truly is democracies versus non-democracies. And so that really helps Wilson's point a little bit. As soon as Congress declared war, America started mobilizing and sending soldiers over to go fight. This is a tough process because we go from peace and neutrality to um, fighting in the war, and we are short on military supplies, weapons, and people. They're, they do um, start a draft, and they get a lot of Americans to join the military. And when the military goes over to France, they do have a, they do have a pretty big effect, mainly because, <clears throat> mainly because they are excited to go over there. They're motivated. Um, if you remember anything about War One, there was a lot of trench warfare, and so a lot of the British, the, a lot of the British, French, and German soldiers had kind of grown weary of fighting, and so when the Americans come over, they kind of bring new life, and so it's not very, not very long after that, the Germans uh, end up going into retreat, and then they sign an armistice, and that's what's going to lead to the Treaty of Versailles. Here are some of the pictures from World War One, just to kind of get an idea of what it was like. It was very brutal fighting. One of the, um, it's really considered to be one of the first modern wars. Lots of people die. It's very, very violent. They have new weapons that are really going to change warfare. Uh, that was a trench. This is some tanks, flamethrowers. You had poison gas. Um, there's another example of someone who was, who was affected by poison gas and also more poison gas. <clears throat> in the United States, this is shifting gears, in the United States there was lots of propaganda to try to unify the war effort. And what happens is, they, as they unify the war effort, like any war effort, they take away some individual li liberties. One thing is, Americans are persuaded to plant victory gardens, so a lot of the supplies could be sent overseas. Um, they also try to get people to enlist in the military, and then to buy war bonds, which is how they're really going to pay for the war. Here are some posters that are trying to convince people to build their own, or make their own gardens. They really characterized the Germans as Huns, and that led to discrimination against Americans of German descent. Calling them Huns would be like calling them barbarians, and Americans, they actually stopped teaching Germany in, German in school, and they restricted the playing of German music, and they even renamed German food, like the hamburger they started calling the Liberty Steak, and sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. There are some examples of the propaganda, and showing how the Germans were, were Huns, and they were almost like the devil, and They'd done a lot of bad stuff. That's trying to get people to fully support the war effort. And then in the U.S., they passed what was called the Sedition Act, which was kind of similar to the Sedition Act earlier in American history, which said basically that you couldn't speak out against the government. And it was also partly trying to stop disloyalty and worried about German spies and then worried about communism. And so they could, they could put you in jail for, um, for just having 
different opinions from the government and expressing those opinions. So they put like socialists and anarchists and pacifists and labor union, union leaders sometimes in jail for that. Of course, this is a violation of our spe free speech rights. Another consequence of America's involvement in the war was that President Wilson took a leadership role at the Versailles Conference where they were trying to discuss peace. He wanted to create a lasting peace based on his 14 points, um, which he hoped would eliminate many causes of the war. He called for all of these things right here, the abolition of secret treaties, a reduction in armament, armaments, which are weapons, an adjustment in colonial claims, freedom of the seas. He also tried to put proposals in place that would ensure world peace in the future. He proposed removal of economic barriers between countries, the promise of self-determination, that means vote for those oppressed minorities, and a world organization that would provide a system of collective security for all nations, which would be the League of Nations. However, the other allies, they're really determined to protect their own national interests. They don't necessarily want to make the world a better place. So when they met, Wilson didn't really get to accomplish everything that he wanted in the 14 points. In fact, he, he caved on most of those points other than like maybe the boundaries and then the League of Nations. And so in order for him to get the League of Nations in place, he kind of gave in to some of the other things. And the Treaty of Versailles is going to be an awful treaty. Um, it includes the War Guilt Clause, where Germany had to accept complete and total blame for the war. It caused Germany to have to pay reparations. They were forced to pay $33 billion to the Allies. It also created new national borders, um, which was part of the 14 points. Um, and it also, that War Guilt Clause is really what's going to hurt Germany. And then that reparations, those are going to hurt Germany as well. Um, really, they're blaming Germany for the war when it wasn't Germany's fault. And so Germany is going to go through this massive economic crisis, um, massive inflation in Germany, which is going to lead directly to World War II. Treaty, the Treaty of Versailles is the cause of World War II. And here's an example of two pictures. This is the first Europe before the war in 1914, and then Europe after the war. And so you can kind of see like there's a huge difference before the war and after the war. And this shows some of the economic problems in Germany with the hyperinflation and how money was virtually worthless. Thank you very much for watching the 5.4 video. If you haven't already, please go and do the notes guide and also take the video quiz. Thank you.